Welcome to Exponential Church's online experience. We are back to our live in-person services and we want to invite you to join us every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. We meet at Renaissance Charter School in Tradition, located at 10900 Tradition Parkway here in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's super easy to find us. Just drive west all the way to the end of Tradition Parkway and you can't miss us. We are at the end of the road on the left. But we understand that some people are not ready for the large gathering type setting yet. So that's why we are continuing with these online experiences. This is a condensed version of what a Sunday morning like experience would look like at Expo. But it is the same sermon that Pastor Steve is going to be preaching to those who are gathering for the live services. So you're not missing out on that. If you don't want to feel alone watching the message today, just smash that like button on this video and then share it with your friends on social media. Or if you're watching on YouTube, copy the link and text it to your friends and family. You never know, this could be a life-changing message to someone you know. So without further ado, let's open God's Word and worship Him this morning. had the Olympics on just about 24-7 this past week and uh, man we have seen some really exciting things happening and, and really some some shocking things take place this past week and, and of course our our thoughts and our prayers they go out to Simone Biles and uh, her mental health and, and all those that this just brings awareness to that struggle with mental health issues and uh, that has definitely been one of the biggest news for Americans this past week um, through all of that. <clears throat> While I was writing this message, I, I had the Olympics on in my office, and, um, and this guy, Bobby Fink of the United States, he made this huge come-from-behind um, surge to win the gold medal in the men's 800-meter swim. It was the first time uh, this event's been swum in, swam in the Olympics, I believe, and uh, he was in fifth place after the, the final turn, coming into the, the, the last 50 meters of this race. He was in fifth place, and he just blew past all the other swimmers, almost like they were just standing still, and he took the gold easily, and it was just an incredible, incredible race. One sport that, that I've been watching a lot of this week is uh, the handball tournament. Have you guys seen this? Uh, it's kind of like a mix between like basketball and soccer and lacrosse. I really don't even know how to explain it. Um, and, and when I first saw it earlier in the week, I, I was thinking to myself like, why on earth is this an Olympic sport? Like it's just weird, you know? But after watching it, I kind of think I want to pursue a shot at being on the next USA handball team in, in 2024. I, I, I think I'm ready to go. Uh, it, it's quite addicting to, to watch. Another less popular sport, but an exciting Olympic sport, is, is that of boxing. They, they, they actually, they're, they're beginning the, the medal bouts of, of the boxing tournament uh, starting tomorrow, actually. According to Olympics.com, Boxing has has featured has been featured at every modern Olympic game since the St. Louis Games in 1904, with the exception of Stockholm in, in 1912. But it wasn't until 2012 in London when they started having women's boxing. Since some of the world's greatest ever boxers have come from the Olympic boxing's previously amateur rankings, it it used to be that only amateurs could could be in the Olympics. Uh, and, and so guys like gold medalist Muhammad Ali, uh, previously he was known as Cassius Clay, uh, he won gold in Rome in 1960. Uh, George Foreman, he won gold in Mexico City in 1968. Sugar Ray Leonard won gold in Montreal in 1976. And um, uh, Vladimir Kitschko uh, won gold in Atlanta in 1996. Floyd Mayweather won bronze in Atlanta in 1996. And then Anthony Joshua, uh, he won gold in, in the London 2012 games, uh, just to name a, a few of these guys. Uh, like I said, it used to be uh, only amateurs were allowed to, to enter into boxing. No professional boxing was allowed until the last Olympics in 2016 in, in Rio. 
and they allowed professional boxers for the very first time to compete in the Olympics. But here's the thing. There were no professional boxers that made it past the round of 16. I thought that was pretty interesting. The, the, the most consistently successful countries in boxing over the years have been the United States. We have 50 gold medals on hand. And then Cuba with 37 gold medals. And I thought that was kind of cool uh, uh, in there. And, and, and so again, boxing doesn't get a whole lot of headlines, but we do end up seeing it a lot. If, if there is any sport in the Olympics that I do not want to be a part of, it would be boxing. I want nothing to do with getting punched in the face just to get a medal. I just, I just don't want to do that. I, I, I guess you'd say I'm more of a lover than a fighter, as that old country song would say, right? <clears throat> However, although I have no desire to be in a physical fight with anyone for any reason, in Scripture, I learned that I am in a spiritual fight. In fact, we all are. Look at, with me, if you would, at, at 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And verse number 12, and, and look at what it says. It says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul is, is telling his friend Timothy here. Paul, the guy who wrote this book, this, he was writing a letter to his friend Timothy. That's why it's called Timothy, right? First Timothy. Paul is telling his friend Timothy to fight. The, the, the word fight in the Greek, it means to, to compete, uh, fight, struggle, strive to do with intensity and with effort. So, so what is being said here is that we are to put forth intense energy and maximum effort to compete and win against evil, against sin, and against the devil. We are all in a fight. We will not gain the eternal prize that awaits us in heaven. Re remember what we talked about uh, in the first week of this series there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, verse 27? We're not going to gain the prize by being haphazard followers of Jesus. We need to be fully engaged in the battle. The way we fight is through striving for the good fight of the faith. Notice that the word fight is used a second time here in this verse. The second time that it is used, it, it, it's a noun. It's the Greek word agon, which means place of assembly, the, the place of contest, then contest, then conflict. It's often applied figuratively to life as a struggle with a prize. So once again, Paul is illustrating that the life of a believer is a contest that requires tremendous effort and struggle. But I want you to notice something in this verse that, that, that I've never even noticed in, until studying for this message. Notice that Paul's challenge to Timothy is not to fight the good fight of faith. It actually says to fight the good fight of the faith. Now, I am by no means an English scholar, okay? But this is what I read about this. The word the that precedes the word faith there, it is, a, it is a definite article, which means it is not faith in general that's being referenced here. Paul is not just encouraging Timothy to, to live by faith, although that's incredibly vital for us. But Paul is encouraging Timothy to struggle for the faith, for the truth of God and the fact that Jesus is the way and the only way. As followers of Christ, we must compete well for the faith. So, so the question then becomes this. How do we compete well for the faith? Well, first, we must know about our competition. Look, I, I, I said it a couple, a couple weeks ago. We are not fighting against other people or other believers. Look at what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse number 12. He said, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We're not, fi we're not fighting against other people. We are fighting a battle against Satan and his demonic forces. And it's because of this extreme competition that we are told there in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. 
I like the note that's in the ESV study Bible here on, on Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12. It says this, This list of spiritual rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers gives a, 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 so, a so, sobering glimpse into the devil's allies, the, the spiritual forces of evil who are exceedingly powerful in their exercise of cosmic powers over this present darkness. And yet, Scripture makes clear that the enemy host is no match for the Lord, who, who has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them, which that's a reference to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, by the way. But also check out what Ephesians chapter 1, verse, beginning there, verse 19, what it says. It says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And in case the devil and his demonic forces scare you, let me encourage you with Jesus' words in John chapter 16 and verse 33. He said, I have, I, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Look, we are facing a fierce competitor, but thankfully we can fight confidently. Why? Because Christ has overcome the world. The second thing that we can do to fight well for the faith is to fight the way that Jesus fought, by, by obeying God. Now, this seems like a pretty simple concept. But in this world that we're living in today, so many people just want to do things their own way. We're, we're living in a culture that, that tells everyone just to, just to do what they feel like doing and, and whatever they just feel like is the best thing to do. And look, I know I just turned 40 a, a couple weeks ago and so now I'm this, you know, this fuddy dud of a guy, right? This, this old fuddy dud. But this is not the way to live. This, this modern cultural trend of just do you, just do whatever feels good for you. Um, you know, there are no absolutes. There is nothing that says this is right, this is wrong, all of that. Listen, that is not the way to live. This is not the way to find true happiness or peace or contentment in life. And, and, and the proof is all around us. If, if you just look at our world, our world is never happy. Our world is never satisfied. And the reason for this, we see it in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 14, and verse 12, it says, There is a way that seems right to man, but the, its, its end is the way of death. Jesus told us himself that, that living for the world, that, that, that we talked about earlier, controlled by Satan, right? The, the world is controlled by Satan. It will not result in happiness, but only living for him will result in happiness. In John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. True life, true happiness, true peace, true satisfaction in life is only going to come from Jesus Christ. And, and, and look, can you be a Christian and not live a godly life? Yeah, probably so. I, I, I mean, that's something between, between you and God. But as we talked about a couple weeks ago, if we're running in a race... We should run to obtain the prize. I think one of the biggest causes of the decline in, 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 the, in church attendance and in people who profess to, to be followers of Jesus in, in, in the world today, it's not the corruption that we see in churches. It, it, it's not bad churches or, or bad pastors. We, we hear about those, those issues, but, but in all reality, those things are few and far between. I think one of the biggest issues is casual Christians. People who claim to be followers of Christ, but yet nothing in their everyday lives would show that they really are Christ followers. We're not struggling for the faith. We're not good ambassadors for Christ. Stop right now and ask yourself this question. Is my everyday life a reflection of the faith I claim to possess? You see, this is why we need we read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Again, in this verse, we see that little word, therefore. The, the, the reason why therefore is therefore is because it's tying us back to the entire argument that the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans is pointing to. The mercies of God. As Christians, we are to give our entire lives to Christ because of the mercies and the grace that He has shown us in saving us from our sins. Paul, the, the, the writer of the book of Romans, he says that we are to present our whole bodies as a living sacrifice. What he is saying here is that both body and soul belong to God. The way we live matters. So, so, so don't conform to the world, but be transformed. Look, transformed lives will compete well for the faith. Loving God and loving others will compete for the faith. Uncompromised lives will compete well for the faith. Jesus-focused lives will compete well for the faith. Christians, we have to fight the good fight of the faith. Going back to our text, you'll, you'll notice that, that Paul also encourages Timothy to take hold of the eternal life. First and foremost here, please understand that Paul is not suggesting that anyone can acquire eternal life on their own efforts. That's not what he means here. He's also not suggesting that, that Timothy does not possess eternal life. That, that, that he's trying to say that Timothy's not a Christian. Notice the similarity in this phrase here with the phrase before it. He didn't say take hold of eternal life. He said take hold of the eternal life. Another definite article which tells us that he is talking about a particular life to be experienced. What is he trying to tell Timothy? Uh, what he was trying to tell Timothy was to experience more of what this eternal life is in the present life. So then the same type of question arises. What is this eternal life to take hold of? I, I, I think many people, they separate their, their future life in heaven from their current life. But this is not a future life, but a present reality. We can experience the blessings and the joys of our eternal life in this present life that we live. We can do this by, by living in relationship with God, because that's what we're going to do in heaven. Jesus described it this way in John chapter 17 and verse, verse 3. He said, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here's the thing. Knowing God does not mean acquiring information and truth about God. I, I, I've met a lot of people over the years who, who have a lot of information about God. They, they know the Bible really well. Probably, in some cases, they probably know the Bible better than I do as, as a pastor. But yet, they still don't know God. Knowing God is being in an active relationship with Him. It's like this. I know who Michael Phelps is. He, he's the greatest swimmer of all time. He's, he's the most decorated Olympic athlete of all time. And I could go through and, and, and rattle off information about Michael Phelps, including his height and his weight and his championships and his medals and about his wife and about his kids. But do I actually know Michael Phelps? No, I don't know him. If I showed up at his house today, I'd be arrested and served a restraining order. Why? Because knowing a bunch of information about someone does not mean that I have a relationship with that person. We must live our lives actively getting to know Christ and communing, communing with Him daily through our personal Bible study and through our personal time of talking with God through prayer. Taking hold of eternal life is the life of Jesus in us. Colossians chapter 3, it says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. 
we can set our minds on things above and experience the glory of God down here on earth. What a blessing that is for us. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 10. He, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants us to experience the unfathomable goodness of heaven right here and now. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven. The more we obey Jesus, love like Jesus, serve like Jesus, and forgive like Jesus, the more of heaven that we can experience while in this present life. Don't you want to take hold of that? I, I, I mean, heaven, it's, it's, it's the land of no mores, right? And no more tears and no more pain and no more death. Revelation chapter 21 or verse 4, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And we can take hold of this type of peace and contentment in this present life when we fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of the eternal life. I told you guys just a few minutes, minutes, minutes ago, I have no desire to be a part of the games as a boxer. I don't think I would enjoy getting punched in the face over and over again just to get a medal. But yet there are all kinds of men and women who live for the game. They've dedicated their lives to boxing, understanding that they're, that they're going to take some blows along the way, and yet they still choose Probably one of the most iconic boxers of all time is actually a fictitious character created in Hollywood in the 1970s. It's the story of an uneducated, lower-class, blue-collar man living in the slums of Philadelphia doing questionable work who ends up getting a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship. You already know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Rocky Balboa. Rocky was an underdog in this match. He was undersized, he was slower, he was less talented than his, 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 his uh, opponent, Apollo Creed. I mean, Rocky's trainer, Mickey, he, he didn't even think much about Rocky at all. But Rocky was motivated to give it his all. Despite all the odds being against him, he, he was motivated. Rocky's main motivation was the recognition of, of, of his dream come true to be this big professional boxer and, and the chance to make millions, an opportunity turn his life around. And in the end, Rocky fought a good fight and he inspired the world in the process. And even today, people treat Rocky like he was a real person. And every year, thousands of people go to Philadelphia, they find the famous Rocky steps from, from the movie and they run up those steps and they jump around up in the air when they get to the top, just like Rocky Balboa did in the movie. They even have a statue of Rocky, this fictitious character, in Philadelphia. By finding his purpose and giving it everything that he had, everything changed for this boxer. In, in, in our text there in, in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, Paul concludes his, his two encouragements to Timothy by reminding him that he has been called by God and he reminds him of his confession of Christ in the presence of many witnesses. As Christians, we have been called by God to do the work of God. All of us have been, been called in this. This is our purpose. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 19, Jesus tells his disciples, in, in, in speaking of the church that, that he would establish, Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Think about this for a moment. What would it look like for the people of God to release the kingdom of heaven everywhere they go? What would it look like for, for even just a, a, a few of us to truly say yes to the calling of God on our lives, to live for more than just the, the worldly pleasures and the worldly comforts, to, to give all of ourselves to it and live with an eternal perspective. You are called to make an eternal impact far greater than you can imagine. 
God has placed within you the keys to the doors of heaven. And he longs to use you to release his love, grace, peace, mercy, and redemption to others in, 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 who are in desperate need of him. He longs to call you out from the daily grind of life into a higher pursuit of seeing the earth transformed by his goodness. This is our fight. Give it all you've got. Thank you for joining us for our online experience. If you gave your life to Jesus today or if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me and I'll get back with you as soon as possible. If you'd like to invest in the ministry of Expo Church, you can do that from anywhere as you have two easy options. You can text the dollar amount to the number 84321 and follow the instructions to give that way. Or you can go to our website, expochurch.com, find our giving tab and follow those instructions. I want to thank those of you who chose to be faithful in your giving to this ministry and I want you to know that your generosity is helping meet the needs of those in our community as well as reaching people across the world through our global giving to missionaries around the world. Thank you again for joining us today and we hope you have a fantastic week.